All right, so what I wanted to do in this video is just lay out where these four kinematic equations come from, you know? I just kind of presented them last time, and it's like, well, all right, I can try to use those, but like, where do they come from? So um, I want to motivate where these equations come from in terms of the underlying mathematics, and just talk through a couple of graphical examples, which I hope will make this a little bit more concrete and applicable to problems. Um, that said, I won't be testing you on the derivations of these, so no need to like, scrupulously go through this video and like make sure you know all the steps and their deriv derivations. I just want to have them there for you to see so you can say, okay, he didn't just pull this out of nowhere. Um, these equations do have, you know, something motivating them. <laughs> all right, so let's hop in. Okay, so I want to start from the basis of Newton's second law, which is that force is mass times acceleration. So our interest, our interest in this equation is that if we know the accelerations on things, then we can finally start to talk about how they move, right? Accelerations, if I know my car accelerates at a rate of 15 meters per second squared, that means something to me. It means it's speeding up relatively quickly. Um, yeah, so the origin of the kinematic equations comes from an interest in this, <laughs> In, in Newton's second law, and some applications from calculus. So what I'm gonna do is I wanna take just one component of the acceleration. I'll take the x component of it a, in the x direction, all right? And what I'm interested in doing is discovering something about, about how the velocities and uh, positions of my particle change as a function of time. So again, to kind of set this up completely, hello. What are you doing, Zyborg? To set this up completely, this refers to a massive particle. The, the four equations refer to a massive particle, which is subject to some external acceleration in, in some direction, and which has velocities, uh, a velocity component in that direction, as well as a position that we can mark in that direction. So we're keeping track of the position and velocity as they're affected by this constant acceleration. So ax is constant in time, doesn't change in time. That's one of the, that's the main requirement of the kinematic equations. Okay, so what I'm gonna do to show this third equation is I'm gonna integrate ax once. Recall, first of all, that uh, acceleration is the derivative of velocity in a given direction. So it's the derivative of velocity. So if I integrate acceleration, I should get out of velocity. Let's do that. Integral of ax dt is going to be ax times t, since a is constant in time, plus some constant, capital C. Okay, and that's supposed to be my velocity over time. It's supposed to give me a velocity. A derivative of velocity gives me acceleration, so an integral of acceleration should give me velocity. All right. And now I can think, okay, what happens at time t equals zero? Well, at time t equals zero, if this is my t equals zero frame here, then the velocity should be equal to the initial velocity. So at t equals zero, this term equals zero, which means all that's left on this left-hand side is that constant. So that constant really must be the initial velocity. In other words, I have v of t is v naught in the x direction plus ax times t. Okay, or in terms of like final and initial, so this would be v final is v initial in the x direction plus a times delta t. All right, and I will go through and rederive it for this one, but um, the way I convert from one to the other is by instead of making this an indefinite integral, I make it a definite integral from t0 to t final. Okay, but don't worry too much about that. So that's kind of a minor point. All right, so that gets me my third equation. To get to my first equation, well, what's velocity? Velocity is the derivative of position with respect to time. Nice. So if I integrate velocity, I ought to get out position. Let's go ahead and integrate this thing. So integral of velocity dt is going to be, I'm going to integrate on the left side, so v naught x times t plus uh, ax times t squared over 2 
plus another constant, I'll call it capital D. And as before, if I set the time equal to zero, t equal to zero, the first two terms will cancel. So the, velocity, the, the position at time t equals zero is just d. So I call that my initial, initial position, my displacement at time t equals zero, x zero. There we go. All right, so that gets me my first equation, that x final is x initial plus v naught in the x direction times delta t plus one half a in the x direction times delta t squared. So again, this is my first equation. This is my third equation. Now, if I were to take my uh, third equation here, so this equation in pink, and isolate for uh, acceleration, I would get out that ax is v final minus v initial over delta t, right? Okay, so if I plug that over here, what do I get? I get that x final equals x initial plus v naught x times delta t plus one half v final in the x direction minus v initial in the x direction over delta t times delta t squared. All right, long haul, but we made it. So what does this say? If I simplify, it gives me that x naught plus v naught delta t plus the final delta t over two minus the initial delta t over two is x final. Okay, there we go. All right, and if I look at this, stare at it for a second, I've got some, oops, I said initial, I meant to say not, my fault, zero, there we go. So if I subtract this away from this, so the fourth term away from the second term, I just end up with positive a half, right? Positive a half. Um, so x final is x initial plus v naught plus vf over two delta t. That's just a simplification. All right, and that is my, what is that? That is my second equation, two. Okay, we can get the trickster, we can get that fourth kinematic equation by isolating uh, for delta t in these two equations and then plugging into the other. So uh, I won't do that just because it's probably gonna be boring. <laughs> but similarly to the way that down here we isolated for a and then plugged in, you isolate for delta t up here and plug in, that'll pop out for you number four. So these equations are redundant in the sense you don't really need all of them, um, but who wants to rederive them every single time, right? That's why we just lay them out as four. Okay, the last thing I wanted to do is give a graphical example, a graphical example um, of what some acceleration, velocity, and position graphs might look like for a problem you could observe out in nature somewhere. Okay, so let's say that I'm considering the movement of a particle left to right that's just subject to some wind. I don't know, fine. So the wind puts some force on this particle we'll say that this is a positive direction for a force, positive direction for a force. And let's say that the, um, the initial velocity of the particle, vi, is negative two meters per second, so pointing leftward, okay? And we'll say that the initial position for it is, I don't know, let's say x initial is 10, just for fun. I will make this, since we know that force and acceleration are just scaled by mass, I'll make this an acceleration. So acceleration, let's say the initial acceleration is, mm, let's say two meters per second squared, positive. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna draw three different graphs, one of velo uh, acceleration, one of velocity, and one of position. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw in some hypothetical acceleration over time, We'll draw in some velocities over time and we'll draw in the positions. So let's say that initially my acceleration is two meters per second. Boom. Let's say that goes on for a duration of like three seconds. So zero to three, boom. 
All right, and then let's say that there's momentarily an acceleration that is zero. So zero for, let's call that two seconds, up to five seconds here. And then we'll say up to eight seconds, we'll have an acceleration that is negative three, negative three meters per second squared down here. All right, so this is just something that I have claimed as, uh, you know, the future for this particle. It'll be accelerated in these ways going forward. Once I've, narrow, once I've nailed that down, everything else is determined. I can use my third kinematic law to know that the velocity final is the velocity initial plus acceleration times change in time. So that'll, that'll give me my velocities here. So <clears throat> over time, what I'll find for my velocity is that it starts out at negative two meters per second. That's just given in the problem, minus two. And then over time, every second, it's gonna pick up two meters per second. So the acceleration is two meters per second squared. So every second, it's gonna pick up two meters per second. If you like, I'll look at the end of the interval after three seconds. So the final velocity is gonna be the initial velocity, which is negative two, times the acceleration for this interval, which is two meters per second squared, times delta t for this interval, which is three seconds. So over this first three second interval, I'll go ahead and mark them in three, five, there we go. Over this first three second inter interval, the final velocity must go up to, uh, oops, sorry, this should be a plus, my fault go up to negative two plus six, that's gonna be four meters per second. So it's gonna make it up to four. Boom. Okay, now it's linear. Uh, it's linear, if you like, because velocity changes linearly with time, uh, if you have constant acceleration. So since we're linear in time, this is a line, straight line. Okay, over the next little interval here, from three to five seconds, I have zero acceleration. So that doesn't mean that I have zero velocity, right? So at this point t equals three, I have a positive velocity, which means that my particle is moving to the right. So it's moving to the right. Now it's moving with a constant velocity during this zero acceleration interval. Boom. All right, and then at there, for the last interval, which I say is from five until eight seconds, there we go, from five until eight seconds, I've got an acceleration of negative three. So negative three meter per second squared. So if I wanna find the final velocity at the end of the interval overall, boom, what I can do is I can take that three second interval from five to eight seconds, and again, apply my third rule, or my, my uh, what do you call this? My third kinematic equation. So the final at the very end, like V8, I'll say, at the end of the interval, V8, is whatever was the, uh, start of the interval, so here that's gonna be four, four, plus whatever the acceleration is, negative three, negative three, times the change in time, which is three seconds. So that's gonna be negative five when all said and done. So I'll be way down here at negative five. Negative five meters per second. And again, I'll just connect that with a line. So this tells me over all time what the velocity is at each point in time, given these little blocks of constant acceleration. Notice that everything that is a constant in acceleration turns into a line for velocity. Position is gonna be a little bit different. So position, remember, is the integral of velocity. So lines, uh, in, in, when, when we have straight lines on the velocity side, we're gonna have parabolas uh, for position. Okay, so let's sketch these in. My initial position is eight. I'm gonna put that right here. There we go, eight. So my initial position is eight. Let's see what happens to um, position after this three second first interval. So for this, I will use my first equation. X final is X naught plus VX naught delta T plus one half AX delta T squared. Okay, so my Final position at the end of this three second interval is gonna be initial position plus V naught times delta T plus one half A times delta T squared. Okay, and what is this for us? It's going to be just eight plus, let's see, what's our initial velocity? Negative two, negative two, 
times delta t, which is three seconds, plus one half times acceleration, which is two over this interval, times three squared. That number is just 11. Boom. But notice now that the line that connects these two points is not going to be straight, right? Because uh, position is the integral of velocity, and velocity here is not a constant, but a straight line. So instead, it's going to uh, form a parabola. The derivative of position starts out a negative number, negative 2, right? So it's going to curve down at first. Then at some point, it looks like maybe t equals 1 set, or t equals 1, somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah, it should be t equals 1. Velocity equals 0. So that's where we'll have x not changing. And then over time, it'll curve back up to that final position. So we'll get this little parabola-like curve here. All right. And then for a while, velocity is constant for those next two seconds. So this is 11. There we go. For those next two seconds, velocity is constant. So it'll just keep going in a straight line. Boom. And that'll be that'll take us up to, uh, let's see, 4 for my velocity at that point, times 2 seconds. Gets me up to uh, 19. So 8 plus 11 gives me 19. Boom. And then I've got this mess here. I've got a big drop in velocity. So let me go ahead and do that. What I'll do is I'll again apply this x final uh, equation over this interval from 5 to 8 seconds, and I'll come back to you in a sec with the answer. All right, and I get out negative 17.5. That's my value once we hit t equals 8. Boom, for position. OK, so it's saying I'm to the left of my initial position by, what is that, 25.5 units. All right, and as before, <clears throat> what I'll do is I'll draw in a curve. So now I've got a negative, uh, a negatively decreasing velocity. So it's you know slanted downward, so to speak. That's going to correspond to a parabola, which is initially has a has a large slope, four meters per second, and then over time decays to zero. Right there, there's my zero slope, and then becomes very negative. Boom. Okay, so again, parabola shaped. That's my goal here. All right, so there you have it. Position, velocity, and acceleration graphs for some set of initial conditions and some choice of accelerations, some choice of blocks of accelerations. That's how we go ahead and apply these equations to determine um, velocity, position, um, yeah, all of those over time. So a few things to notice. The first thing that I want you to notice is that in regions where acceleration is positive, velocity has a positive slope. Acceleration is a concave up, which means it's like a parabola that faces upward, like that way. Um, in regions where acceleration is zero, velocity is constant, but not necessarily zero itself. And uh, position makes a straight line. OK? The last thing to notice is that where acceleration is a negative number, velocity has a negative slope. Hopefully that makes sense. And position forms a concave down, a concave down uh, parabola. All right, I think that's it for my little example. Hopefully you found that useful. It helped build up a little bit of intuition. Um, and I hope your DLs also assist in this some. I think that's it for this lecture. Thanks for joining me. And uh, up next, you'll see the course finale.